This is where the ministry started, right here. And uh, then there's the Creation Museum, and then the Ark, and now our new headquarters. And you look at that and you say, wow, look what God has done. Well, hi, everyone. It's great to uh, have you all here. Um, so this is a, a unique uh, weekend because we're actually celebrating our 30th anniversary as a ministry. So uh, it was actually December 1993 when we incorporated uh, legally as a ministry. And then 1994 is when we actually moved to this area. Uh, but that's why uh, I was asked to do something a little different today instead of one of my teaching programs. And I presume you saw that on the schedule. So uh, a lot of people have often asked me to give my testimony, how did all this come about, you know, and you growing up uh, in Australia and how did you get to America and what about uh, your family and so on. So that's what I'm going to do today. So this is a very different sort of talk and hopefully too it will be uh, a little challenging for us in some areas, uh, but it's really about to me what it means to responsibly step out in faith uh, to do things for the Lord and it's also a reminder of the importance of parents uh, to impact your children and to raise up godly offspring. So the Ministry of Answers in Genesis is an apologetics ministry, which doesn't mean we apologize for our faith, of course. It means we teach people apologetics. We equip them with answers to the skeptical questions of our day. We stand on the authority of the Word of God and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the ministry itself uh, has a number of uh, different facets to it. In fact, Answers in Genesis is not just the two attractions. A lot of people come here and see the two attractions, the Creation Museum and the Ark Encounter, but it's much more than that. We do a lot of publishing. We have a lot of books and curricula. We have a research department. We have the attractions, of course. We have all sorts of educational programs that are done here uh, during the day and at the Ark and different times of the year, and we have special conferences and so on. We have a daily radio program. We do a lot of other media. We have a lot of internet sites, websites and we do domestic and international outreach. Uh, so there's a lot to uh, this ministry. We have the two attractions, the Ark Encounter and the Creation Museum. Now I'm speaking here today with a, a special talk and tomorrow, uh, Martin Isles, who is from Australia and he's joined our ministry. In fact, uh, the board just uh, approved my uh, plan for the future and appointed him as executive CEO under me as founder CEO as part of preparing for the future. Um, I know the board a few years ago started talking about what happens when the bus hits Ken Ham and, and they kept saying that every year after year and I got that way. I don't even go near the buses. I don't go anywhere near the, the shuttle buses down the arc. I keep way away from them. If I see a bus on the road, I go a different road. I just keep right away from the buses. Uh, but we do have to plan for the future and a lot of Christian organizations don't do that properly. And I wanted to make sure we were doing this while uh, we're all here to help each other and mentor each other. And so uh, Martin has really taken over the reins of a lot of the day-to-day -day stuff. I still do the oversight ministry. I'm not going to retire. Um, my philosophy of retirement is like Moses. You know, he, he retired the, late, the day the Lord took him. Unless, I mean, I told my wife, I said, hey, if you think I shouldn't be doing this anymore, you need to tell me. The trouble is, I won't believe you, you won't believe me. What do we do then? And she said, well, we have um, some kids that are going to tell you, so don't worry about it. We have very th three very strong daughters and two sons. They're going to tell you. So anyway, but I'll, I'll be here as long as the Lord allows me to and continue on. And we want to expand the vision and impact. And uh, so I want to give you part of that uh, testimony today. Uh, also, um, as well as that, we also have our own Christian Academy, Answers Academy, and our daughter Renee actually is the one that founded that and started that, and it's just a few years old, but it's really grown, and we've been renting a facility at a church, which is way outgrown that, so to expand it, we had to get another facility, and that's a whole other miracle, it's a whole other story, which we won't even have time to talk much about today, but the Lord has enabled us to obtain a building at a fraction of what it would normally cost to, to build a building like that. And that's that building there. And this is going to be our new headquarters. The ministry will be over here in this side. This four stories there. And the school will be able to quadruple in size now to go over here. And it's a very unique school in that a discipleship school and teaching true biblical worldview. So we don't uh, have a, a, a school that just allows anybody in. It's very, a very... Um, 
careful as to who we allow because we want to have parents who are intentional about raising godly offspring and that's what it's all about and we have another number of positions going in the ministry we always do and we love to see high school college age come in the summer work seasonal positions we have some housing for them but you might want to check out uh, the jobs that we have available and whether uh, you would uh, look to be here. We're finding an increasing number of people that just can't stay in the places they're in because of the woke culture and what's being forced on them and what they're told they have to do. Or I don't know whether you just saw the federal government uh, has brought in a rule that if you're working uh, there, you have to call people by their pronouns and so on, regardless of who you are. And I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's against... Uh, the Constitution to do that, but they're the sorts of things that are happening, and more and more people are realizing that. So, in Kentucky, here, sort of like an oasis, we have these two uh, major Christian attractions and our whole Christian ministry and reaching out to the world. And I want to mention to you our streaming platform, Answers TV. Answers TV is um, a God honoring, family friendly streaming platform. We have about 6,000 programs on there. We're producing a lot of our own uh, new programming as well. We have a lot of Spanish programs on there, Arabic as well, and it's great for kids, it's great for the whole family. It's sort of, we want it to be the Christian equivalent of like a National Geographic type channel, you know what I mean? And so we have our teaching and our conferences on there, all sorts of Bible teaching. We have other organizations have some of their movies and other teaching on there like Living Waters and Billy Graham Ministries and so on. Uh, so we have a, a lot of material on there and uh, I know parents that tell us their kids once they start watching Answers TV they just that they love it and uh, they, they love watching all the different programs also I want to mention to you that two of my latest books that really sum up what this ministry is all about divided nation cultures and chaos in a conflicted church it's really about why we're we losing the culture why is so much of the church lukewarm why uh, we losing generations from the church, which we're down to less than 9% Generation Z now attending church. Uh, what has happened there? And this is really, I think, the cutting edge message uh, for the church today. And then this one here is uh, one of the latest ones I've written too, Creation of Babel. It's a commentary on Genesis 1 to 11. It's a very unique commentary for, for a start. You can understand it. And that's unique for a lot of commentaries. And it's verse by verse through the first 11 chapters of the Bible, answering all the most asked questions I've been asked in 40 years of this ministry. You know why Genesis 1 to 11 is so important? Because it is the foundation for everything. Did you know that? There's nothing that's not ultimately founded in Genesis 1 to 11. All of our doctrine, everything. You want to deal with the issue of abortion or marriage or whatever you want to deal with, you have to start from Genesis 1 to 11. And sadly, most of our churches don't, and they've given that up. And that's why we have such a mess with so many people not being able to defend their faith and so many of our young people just walking away uh, from the church. Well, the Ministry of Answers in Genesis. So this is our 30th anniversary year of the actual starting of the ministry, although really the ministry started a long time before that, as uh, you will see. And so a lot of people have asked me, how did all this come about? Well, I want to bring a scripture to your attention Proverbs 13 22 a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children or I like to put the word their legacy and to remind us that you know a lot of times when we think of a legacy our inheritance we're thinking of material legacy material inheritance but the most important legacy of all is that spiritual legacy that we need to pass on from one generation uh, to the next. And that's my challenge to us is what legacy are you leaving in this world? What legacy are you passing on to others? And how are we impacting uh, this world for the Lord Jesus Christ? Out in the lobby out there, uh, you will see an exhibit about my mother and, and father. And we call it the Ham Family Legacy Exhibit. And I'll be out there after this for a meet and greet if you want to come out and uh, say hi. Uh, but that particular exhibit it's just a small exhibit but it's there to really challenge people it has my father's bible uh there and it's open to see all these notes that are written in there a little noah's ark he built me many many years ago not knowing that one day we would build a life-size ark and it's a challenge to people what legacy are you leaving uh in this world and what legacy are you leaving in your children your grandchildren because as i say to people the ministry of answers in genesis the creation museum the ark encounter that impacts our our surveys in indicate we impact directly 30 million people a year, 
tens of millions more people a year indirectly, and that's not counting social media. So on social media, for instance, our YouTube channel, Just For Answers and Genesis, we have multiple YouTube channels, but Just For Answers and Genesis just had our 100 millionth view. And so you never know how many people you're impacting there. We have lots of different uh, websites and we have social media, all sorts of different uh, posts that we do. And a number of us have social media platforms that we uh, impact the world with. Well, I grew up in the country of Australia. And the country of Australia, you know, if you think about it, it is <laughs> the size, basically, of the continental US. And what do we have in, in the continental US? 350 million, something like that, uh, or more people. And Australia has 20 million, or 25 million now, probably. And I actually was born way up the north here and the city of Cairns, way up in the tropical north, which is, and, and have some high mountain ranges on the, on the east coast there, a little different to here. But I grew up all over Australia. In fact, uh, I even lived out in central Australia at one stage when my father was a teacher. And so he has transferred all, uh, all sorts of different places, transferred all around. We lived in some very remote uh, places, actually. And so that was what was tied to my toe when I was a little baby. And there it is. I'm sure they got the date wrong. But, uh, but other than that, it <laughs> doesn't, doesn't feel like I'm that old. Surely I can't be that old. Uh, but anyway, as you can see, I was very cute. Uh, <laughs> obviously, and uh, they were my parents. My father was a teacher, and you know, my, my parents, because my father was a teacher, he got transferred every three years as they were promoted, and they would be always doing things like starting Sunday schools and inviting evangelists in the area to make sure that they could uh, teach children. My parents never had anything uh, from a material perspective, really. Uh, they always had to live in a government house that was provided for them. And even for, for our cars, my, my father used to do all the repairs himself. He would buy the manuals and learn how to, learn how to um, uh, fix cars. And so he taught me how to do that. And I, I thought, you know, that, this would be really good for later on in life. You know, I know how to take out a clutch plate and pressure plate and how to uh, tune the, the car and the timing light and the tappets and set the points. And today they don't have any of that stuff. It's all computer. and. <laughs> I have no idea how to fix cars these days. You've got to take them to someone who's got a computer that tells you what's wrong with it. And, and uh, you can't even get in the engines anyway because there's no room in there. I don't know how they fit that stuff in. But they were very different days, weren't they? So our family started to, to grow. There were two of us to start with, and I continued to be really cute, uh, as you can see. And you can tell I grew up in Australia holding a koala back then. And uh, there, it, it, uh, the birds like me, as you can see, even like me later on in life too, as you can tell. And our family started to grow. We grew to five kids and then eventually to six, actually. And we used to go and do a lot of camping. Uh, my father would uh, have, well, we, first we had that tent. We used to go camping in that tent. And then they bought a caravan, which is sort of like an RV. Uh, and my father loved to fish. Uh, he, that was one of his favorite things to do, to fish and to cook up those fish. Uh, but you know, most of all, my father loved to be a fisher of men. Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And my favorite pictures of my father, I'm sitting in our house doing a Bible study with his Bible on his knee. He, he would often be asked to actually uh, preach in church when the pastor was away, and people would come up afterwards and say to me, could he be a full-time pastor? <laughs> he was a great teacher. He really was. And, it was a great, and he knew his Bible. Uh, he never went to seminary, but I tell you what, he knew more than some of these people that I saw that went to seminary, and he stood on God's word. And here he is uh, camping, and what's he doing? Well, sitting beside the caravan there, and with his Bible on his knee, learning God's word. That's what I remember about my father, his stand on the word of God. And his favorite verses of scripture were these. Verse, whenever he would come across a verse that said, thus says the Lord, he would stop and emphasize it. I remember him being at Bible, Bible studies and he would say, thus says the Lord. Notice this is God's word. Uh, this is not man's word. Thus says the Lord. Or it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. The authority of the word of God. Have you not read? And he would point that out. Have you not read? He was made them from the beginning. See the authority of the word. By the way, I think all this impacted me uh, in some way. 
Because you notice that the emphasis of answers in Genesis is one on biblical authority. That's what, that's what my father and, and mother, the emphasis was on biblical authority and the gospel. And you know, a lot of people when they think of answers in Genesis think of, oh, they're on about the age of the earth and fossils and so on. Yeah, we deal with all of that. But if you read our mission statement and you read our vision statement, you'll understand that what we're on about ultimately is the authority of the word of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And by the way, that's the only solution to America's problems. Because, you know, when you look at all those issues in the culture today, they all have the same problem. You know what the problem is? They start from man's word, not God's word. And so the solution ultimately, now don't get me wrong when I say this, the solution is not legislation. The solution is not the government. You saw from the elections just this past uh, few days, the solution is not legislation or the government. The solution is God's word and the gospel of changed hearts. That's what the solution is. That doesn't mean you shouldn't get involved in government and try to impact legislation and all the rest of it. I'm not saying you shouldn't do that. But ultimately, the solution is changed hearts. It's God's word and the gospel. And my father always emphasized uh, that, and they were very evangelistic and wanted to reach as many people as they could. Uh, so my father passed away on 9th of June 1995 and I was actually here in America at the time and I was doing a homeschool conference and I knew he was in hospital and not um, likely to survive and I spoke to him on the phone and he didn't want me to come back because he knew I was scheduled to speak at a conference and he said he would rather me impact people for the Lord Jesus uh, than to come back because he said, um, you know, he, he is uh, not going to be there anyway. And it's more important to impact people for the Lord. And it's interesting, uh, Joe Boone, who is our, our president uh, here, he, um, he and his family were at that conference and totally impacted by that conference and turned their lives around. And then he later came into the ministry later on. It's just, it's just amazing the way uh, that God works. And, you know, when my father was in hospital dying, uh, my, a younger brother of mine, who's now with the Lord as well, and I wrote a book all about that called Divine Dilemma, which is out there dealing with the death and suffering issue. Um, when uh, my brother was sitting with my father, he said to my father, why did you love God's word so much? And it was interesting. He said, because when he was 16, his father died. So I never, never knew my grandfather on my father's side. He said his father died when he was 16, so he didn't have an earthly father then here, so he turned to the words of his heavenly father, and he read them over and over and over and over again. He saturated himself in the word of God. And you know, Scripture says a lot about saturating yourself in the word of God and, and how that impacts you in all sorts of ways. And the verse of Scripture that was on my father's grave is this one, for to me to live is Christ and to die his gain. My father died at 66 years old, actually, and my mother lived through to nearly 92. And uh, you know, she had to deal with the loss of my father, and then uh, a son uh, who was, uh, had a young family, a wonderful Bible teaching pastor who died of a horrible dehumanizing brain disease. And the book Divine Dilemma, right, that's the latest book I've written, is all about uh, that particular uh, personal issue in our family and how my mother navigated through all that. She never ever questioned her faith and she was always strong. But, but you still grieve and you still ask those questions and you still struggle. Uh, but it's an, a very interesting uh, book dealing with that and giving answers a lot of other books don't. And so uh, when my mother passed away, they then uh, changed the uh, gravestone there to put both of them on the one there. And my father had on there, for me, me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And for my mother, this was her favorite verse of scripture, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own, un, unto your own understanding. And so there's a verse of scripture that reminds me of my father. And I think it impacted me in, in many, many ways. When I read this verse, I thought, that's my father. Um, it's Nehemiah, where he said, I was very angry uh, when I heard the outcry in these words. But... It wasn't a sinful anger. It was a righteous anger. You remember, you know, the walls were broken down in, in Jerusalem. And why doesn't somebody do something about this? And even when he went back and was rebuilding the walls, he had all sorts of opposition too. And people trying to stop him and mocking him and that. And then there are other things that happened where he said, why, why, are peop why is this person living here? They should be thrown out of here. They shouldn't be allowed to be here. And I saw that sort of anger with my father. You know, when I grew up, the liberal theology was so rampant in the seminaries, and Australia's never been as Christianized as America. And the number of true born-again Christians in Australia is probably less than 
uh, probably a, <laughs> less than a half a percent. Uh, it's very, very small. So I grew up in a, in a pagan culture, and the, the seminaries had l impacted so many of the pastors. And in towns we went to, sometimes there's only one church, maybe two, and my parents had to decide which one stood on God's word the closest. <laughs> and there were times when you would hear the pastor, I was there at a service where he talked about the little boy took at his loaves and fishes, and so um, other people did the same. He set a great example. Well, I, my father was not sitting still in that pew. Well, I was sitting there, and straight after the service, he went up to the pastor, and in a, in, in a firm but gentle way, thus says the Lord, and open up the scriptures. This was a miracle. <laughs> this wasn't just someone take, having some example or something like that. I, I remember once when, um, when uh, a, a devotion book was handed out uh, for daily devotions, and one of the devotions was on the flood, and it said the flood was a local event. My father was livid. And he went to the, the pastor and said, you, you can't hand this out. This is undermining the authority of the word of God. And we need to do something about that. Uh, because, you know, you've got to take God at his word. So he impacted those pastors. Actually, one of those pastors was really liberal. Um, years, years later, my mother was telling when she, when she was in her 80s how she actually met him and he told her how much my father had impacted him and he had changed since that time because of that. You never know, you know, at the time you would never think that possible, um, but you just don't know how God can use you uh, in impacting uh, people. Well, when do you think the first time was that I actually heard about evolution? When I went to school, university, the first time I ever heard about evolution was from a Presbyterian minister in 1964, who from the pulpit said that we can believe in evolution. Um, we didn't last long in that church, actually. <laughs> My parents changed churches pretty quickly. I uh, went up and challenged that pastor, but they changed churches basically immediately. And that, isn't that sad? But the first time I ever heard about evolution was from the pulpit, from a pastor. And by the way, that's why I've always had a burden. We have got to reach the churches. And we have got to go out there and call these people to account. And I, I recognize that revolutions come from the people. And so I, it's very hard to reach the leaders. Uh, so what, this ministry, when we started in Australia, actually, the emphasis has always been go out and reach the people. And if the churches won't let us come, let's build attractions to bring the people in. Then they can go back and impact their churches. And so I've always had uh, that emphasis. And uh, my, my parents really... Uh, set an example for us, standing on the word of God. And I remember my father teaching me. He didn't say it in, in these words, but this is how I put it today. But he sat me down and said, if you don't believe Genesis, how can you believe the rest of the Bible? Genesis 1 to 11 is the foundation for everything. And it really is. It's the foundation for everything. You name any topic at all, you've got to start with Genesis 1 to 11 to build a true Christian worldview. And so in my talks today, that's, that's always been a big emphasis of mine, the relevance of Genesis. That's why I mentioned the book, uh, Divided Nation, and it's the fact that all of our doctrines, the doctrine of marriage, uh, uh, all of our doctrines ultimately are founded in Genesis 1 to 11. Where's the origin of sin? Genesis 1 to 11. Death? Genesis 1 to 11. Marriage? Genesis 1 to 11. Why do we wear clothes? Genesis 1 to 11. Doctrine of work and having to work hard. Because of sin, Genesis 1 to 11. Why did Jesus die on a cross? Genesis 1 to 11. Why is he called the last Adam? Genesis 1 to 11. Why do we have a seven-day week? Genesis 1 to 11. You think Genesis 1 to 11 is important? <laughs> you see why my father was so emphatic on that? And that's been uh, one of the things we've emphasized in this ministry right from the beginning. Genesis 1 to 11, which most churches and most church leaders, not all. I mean, there's probably some great pastors in here today. There often are who stand as we stand, but they're in a minority. The majority of our Christian colleges, seminaries, and church leaders will not stand on Genesis 1 to 11. And we wonder why we've lost the younger generations. We wonder why we've not been impactful on the culture in regard to issues of marriage and so on. And you know, uh, when, I, when I was young, we used to have, uh, and this was a big thing for the schools for those days. There never was a, a Christian schools in Australia in those days. Never, no such thing as homeschooling. There's no Christian university to speak of in Australia today. It's a very pagan culture. But in those days, uh, we used to have uh, what you'd call them costume parties. And we used to call them fancy dress balls. <laughs> um, but 
my <laughs> highlight of the year for the kids at school was when you would dress up and then they'd have a competition who had the best costumes. And so, I don't know, apparently I was a chef that year. And this year I was Robin Hood, although that's probably politically incorrect today, and I'd probably get arrested if I had that on today with a bow and arrow and so on. And, uh, but the year that that pastor taught evolution from the pulpit, my father had this idea. He dressed me up in an ape suit with a, pot, with a potted plant that said, our family tree. <laughs> So it was a spoof on evolution. And you know, in those days, people all laughed at it because they thought it was ridiculous we come from apes. Even the non-Christians thought that was stupid. So anyway, so yeah, I have an interesting history, as you can see. Um, my father was always researching what the liberal critics were saying so that he could teach us answers. Now, he never used the word apologetics, but you know, that's what he was doing. I realized I grew up in a home where there was an emphasis on giving you answers to the skeptical questions of the age or in the text of the Bible so that you can stand on the authority of Scripture and defend the Christian faith. And you look at 1 Peter 3.15, it's one of my favorite verses, always being prepared to make a defense or answer. The word defense or answer comes from the Greek, from the Greek word apologia, from which we get a word apologetics, which means to give a logical reason defense of the faith. And that's what my father uh, taught us. And he taught us to always build our thinking on God's word. See, that's another thing. I, I have a big emphasis in, in when I teach on biblical worldview. A lot of people think biblical worldview or Christian worldview is adding God and Christian things into your thinking. If you truly understand the Bible, it's a revelation from the one who knows everything, who's given us the key information to enable us to build the right way of thinking about everything. So if you want to understand any area, you want to understand death and suffering, you want to understand uh, racism and, and races and so on, you want to understand fossils, you want to understand dinosaurs, you've got to start from Genesis 1 to 11. God's given us the history when he created land animals, what they ate, when death came into the world, the flood of Noah's day, the Tower of Babel, to have the right way of thinking about everything. And then, then you realize, we all go back to Adam and Eve, there's only one race, there are no different races. And... And dinosaurs, it's interesting, you know, how the secular world always like to mock us about dinosaurs. I saw another article about Mike Johnson, that's, who was elected speaker. He, he's a wonderful Christian man, by the way. That's a miracle in itself, that a wonderful Christian man like Mike Johnson would be elected speaker of the House. And he actually led a lawsuit against the state of Kentucky for us uh, a number of years ago, which he won. It was a federal lawsuit because of discrimination by the state of Kentucky against us. But, and that's a whole other story, but um, it's interesting, they, they, there's been a number of articles, there's a new one this morning about him and dinosaurs. But see, they always like to bring up dinosaurs as if, you know, you, you people don't believe dinosaurs lived millions of years ago. You people think dinosaurs got on the earth, lived beside people. See, it's all to do with evolution. So when they're talking about dinosaurs, what they're really saying is, oh, you don't believe in evolution. But they like to single out the dinosaurs, it's interesting. But it's all to do with the fact that, yeah, we don't believe in evolution. Uh, so, but Genesis 1 to 11, as I said, and God's word is the foundation for everything. Well, I went to high school in 1965 in grade eight, still a cute kid, as you can see. And uh, there was my class then back in 1965. And uh, oh, look, the little shy guy over on the side here. Yeah, there he is. And then we had evolution and millions of years in our textbooks. And that's the first time I had it presented in that way. Other than that, it was from the pulpit. And I remember my father sitting down and saying, well, it, you can't believe in evolution because it undermines God's word and you can't add that to the Bible because God's word stands and I don't have all the answers to how they got these millions of years and that, but it, it conflicts with the Bible. And therefore, you need to wait for answers. You know what? Sadly, a lot of parents in those days would, went to church, taught their kids, oh, well, you can believe in evolution. See, my father never did that. It was always, okay, I don't have all the answers, but we need to wait for the answers. But, but look, it conflicts with God's word. I also wanted to tell you a little bit about uh, my mother's mother, my grandmother. We called her Nana in Australia. There she is there. She was a wonderful, godly woman. There she is with uh, my mother. And they lived in a place called Bartlefria. This is the highest, there it is there, the highest peak in the state of Queensland. I've actually climbed that, by the way. I don't think I could do it today, but back then I could. Uh, but it, it, uh, they lived on a cane farm, and they lived in this farmhouse uh, over here. 
uh, this house here that was uh, on stilts. And I want to mention that to you because uh, my grandparents came from Northern Ireland, from Belfast, and uh, they were wonderful Christian uh, people. And so my mother's mother, I, she was always reading a Bible. And I remember one day uh, that, in, if you look at this farmhouse here, it was built on, on stilts, and this is, these are the steps here. And the Jehovah's Witness came to visit. And they came up the steps here, and so my uh, nana came out here, and she opens up a Bible and starts preaching to them from the Bible. And I'll never forget this. I, to this day, I can still see it. They started eventually running down the stairs, and she was running after them, waving the Bible at them, <laughs> And they were disappearing down the road down here, and she was chasing after them with the pipe. Anyway, I've never forgotten that. Um, but in this area, my mother, uh, she, she told us what she did as a teenager, and really impacted me, actually. And I want you to hear her tell you, because she started a Sunday school um, when she was a teenager, because she had a burden to reach children for the Lord. Also found out, I didn't even know this until I videoed her back, when she was 87 years old, I videoed her. I said, can I video you about your life? And spent a couple of hours doing that. And I found out she was mocked at school and, and, and scoffed at because they knew her parents believed the Bible. And uh, so she was persecuted for her faith as a kid uh, in a little country school. But listen to this. But then the other thing was there was two little girls at Bourne Gilly about the mile the other direction. Mm -hmm. And they were upset because they couldn't come. They were only little. So I, um, I thought, okay. So I got my father's bike, tied a cushion on the handlebars. And so I'd ride up to Pongali on my bike. And I'd put one on the bar and one on the handlebar. And I'd ride right back <laughs> down to the Battle Free Hall. So you'd ride at, a mile up to their house, at my collect house, them, then back to the bar, and then two mile back to the hall, and then back home, and then two mile take them back home, and then a mile to go back home yourself. Yeah, well, I did that for I don't know, I can't remember how long I did it for, until one day the father says I better do something about this, so he started running them to Sunday school. I know I did it for a long time, like and months then, or a year or, or be, be months. Can you imagine today riding your bicycle with two people sitting on your bicycle on the road? <laughs> I, I don't think you'd be allowed to do it. <laughs> but she did that because she wanted to teach these kids the things of the Lord and she had this Sunday school. And uh, so um, many years later, in her 80s, uh, she actually met up with those two ladies. You know those two little girls I took on the bike? Uh -huh. A few years ago, they had a reunion at Battlefield School. Mm -hmm. quite a few years ago, and I went to it. And and Beth ran up to me. I didn't know her. And she asked me if I knew her, and she said, oh, do you know me? Oh, no. And she said, I'm Beth Persky. Remember me? I'm a Christian, and I still love the Lord. I said, oh, that's lovely. And his little sister came up and said, oh, I've gone away from the Lord, but I promise I'll come back. <laughs> and was it that Sunday school that really helped with that, do you think? Yeah, yeah. And because, yeah. because you put them on, yeah. your, on the bicycle yeah. handle and yeah. took them to and, Sunday school. And, yeah, and so I met them those, that few years back and that's what happened. That is, that's that. what... Amazing the impact there. And you know what, when she, when she told me about that, my brother David said the same. We heard her tell that story and we thought, she did that for the Lord. What can we do for the Lord? You know, so her, both her and my father impacted us in, in phenomenal ways. Um, another important event in my life was we, uh, my father was transferred to this school uh, in North Queensland, a little place called Mundu, actually. We lived in this house here, and here's the school uh, here. And that was in 1961, and my parents started a Sunday school right here in this building because there was no Sunday school in the area. So they started a Sunday school, and they would invite um, children to come to the Sunday school, but then they would often invite evangelists to come. And actually, this is one of the missionaries that they invited in here. They often had missionaries come to visit us and stay with us uh, so that they could reach people uh, for the Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, this is how we dressed back then. Can you believe my mother dressed me in shorts? Like, can you believe that? I can't believe that. That was embarrassing. Uh, but anyway, that's how we looked back then. But that was a time when this was the church we went to. 
and they invited a missionary from the open air campaigners in Australia to come and do a program for kids and they would pick up, that was the days when you could have a small car and pile 30 kids in the car and uh, take them in, you know, no seatbelt laws in those days. Um, so they were able to get all these kids in there and lots of kids came and it was interesting because the, uh, so this was back in 1961 and the missionary had a challenge for us as kids. If, if you want to go wherever God wants you to go, be what God wants you to be, and do whatever God wants you to do, and you mean it 100%, sign this little, little form here saying, I want to do what God wants me to do and go wherever he wants me to go. And I, I believe it was that time I said, yes, what my parents taught me, yes. Um, I, I put my faith and trust in the Lord Jesus. That's where I stand. I want to go wherever he wants me to go and do whatever he wants me to do. If you do that 100%, by the way, and you really mean it, Beware, because God will take you up on it. Um, and I didn't know that would mean eventually living in Kentucky in America. But back then, you don't think about those things, right? Uh, do you realize 1961 was the same year the famous book, The Genesis Flood, was published? And that was a book that really, in many ways, started the modern creationist movement. It wasn't the first book that I obtained, but it had a big impact the modern creationist movement by Henry Morris and John Wickham and Dr. Henry Morris then founded the Institute for Creation Research in, in California and uh, that uh, is, uh, was the first major, if you like, creation apologetics uh, organization, creation research organization. So unknown to me at the time, uh, born two years after me in 1953 was this cute little girl um, her actual name, and some of you, I know a number of you in this room um, and know of our ministry and know of my wife and so on, and a number of you are supporters, but many people don't know her real name is Marilyn, spelt with two Ys, so it's Mary Lynn, and she was named after her, her mother and grandmother. Um, but her, her mother gave her the nickname Mally, M-A-L-L-Y, when she was a little kid, and that stuck with her. And so we've actually had parcels or letters come to this ministry for Marilyn, and people say, we don't have a Marilyn here, there's no Marilyn here. Um, well, that's her. Anyway, so her nickname is Mally, and that's, you know, if, if I called her Marilyn, she'd be really concerned. Uh, so <laughs> it's Mally. Uh, but anyway, uh, you know, she remembers... Every birth date of all of our grandkids, she remembers every anniversary. How do they do that? It must be a female thing. I, it's a gender thing. I believe in two genders because of that, you know? Um, there's other reasons too, but... Um, so I've had to learn how to remember dates like that. And for me, for my wife, um, for instance, when was she born? I think, okay, it's Pearl Harbor Day. Pearl Harbor Day was the 7th of December. I can't remember she was born the 7th of December, I remember Pearl Harbor Day, and then go to she was born the 7th of December. And then how old is she? And I think, good grief, how old, when was she, what year was she born? And then I remember, when did they discover the helical structure for DNA? Uh, two scientists, Francis Crick and James Watson, they were atheists, they put together this model, it was back in 1953, and they remember, that's right, she was born in 1953. So that's how I figured that out. And by the way, DNA is an incredible molecule because they thought that it proved that life happened by chance because it's just chemistry, and now we know DNA is like a whole information system and language system, and information can't come by chance, languages don't come by chance, DNA cries out in the beginning, God. So anyway, uh, she grew up in Australia, but not in a Christian home like I did, but her mother sent her to Sunday school. Actually, her great-grandfather was uh, Chinese. Uh, and her, she, her mother sent her to Sunday school and at about age 10, at about the same age I was, at Sunday school, the Sunday school teacher was teaching the gospel and uh, she'll testify to this that she, she said, Lord, if you did that for me, if you died on the cross for me, I want to go wherever you want me to go and do whatever you want me to do. You know, she made the same commitment. I found that out many, many years later and God then brought us together. Now I tell you, this ministry wouldn't be here if it wasn't for her because she has been uh, the one who's totally supported me a million percent. She's never questioned that. Uh, she has um, uh, always been there for, for our kids and she's a great counsellor for our kids. 
uh, with, without her support and me going away at times, for sometimes weeks at a time, and again, never complained. She's always said, I'm in this ministry with you. We, we committed to do this together, and the Lord brought us together, and so she's never questioned that. So that is really special. So we moved to Brisbane in 1970, and I first met Mally at this church in 1971. <laughs> By the way, I don't know these dates. I had to write them down because she has to give them to me. Uh, I have to go and say, when do we, when do we first meet? <laughs> she tells me. Uh, so they actually had a competition in this church each year for instead of Miss World and Miss Universe uh, the suburb was Sunnybank and it was a Methodist church so she won Miss Sunnybank Methodist and so she had this sash on saying Miss Sunnybank Methodist handing out hymn books and uh, when she handed the one to me it was love at first sight she said in her mind I'm going to get that guy and well she has a different story but that's okay <laughs> Um, so that was her when I first met her uh, at 17 and here's a picture of us taken in Australia a few years ago and we're standing at the place where I asked her to marry me uh, there in Australia uh, right on the, uh, uh, the beach and we we're sitting in a VW Beetle I had a VW Beetle back then I should get another VW Beetle I mean. yeah it was a green VW Beetle uh, so that's what we uh, drove around in and and uh, there's the invitation my parents received to our wedding look at that and uh, that's our wedding picture and here we are now haven't changed that much um, so when we go back to Australia we like to visit this church it's not a church anymore uh, but we like to just visit there just for old time's sake and get our pictures taken there so uh, I graduated in 1973 with a science degree and 1974 with an education degree. In 1974, someone at our church who knew that I was interested in the whole creation evolution issue because of what I was taught at school and, and uh, you know, my father dealing with those issues, gave me this little book that came from England. You look in the, in the legacy exhibit out there, you'll see it's one of the books that are there on the shelf. It has the first books that, that uh, I obtained. And it's interesting because I read in that book, and I remember sharing this with my father because I was so excited. Was death evolved? Since death may occur in all forms of life, the origin of death is unknown apart from revelation. The Bible alone gives us the true story of the entrance of this dread experience in a life. And at the same time, the Bible reveals to us its final conquest. The last enemy shall be destroyed is death. And then I realized, of course, you, you can't have fossils millions of years before Adam sinned because death came after sin. And you'll notice, for those of you uh, who've heard me talk, uh, usually most of my talks I bring up this because it's so important to understand. And as you walk through the seven seas of history in the Creation Museum, you see the second sea, corruption. God made everything was very good, but to the first man, Adam, Adam, if you disobey, uh, not to eat the fruit of one tree, you'll surely die. Adam disobeyed is the origin of sin, the origin of death. And then Genesis 3.15 has the whole gospel in one verse. It's the whole Bible in one verse. Do you realize that? It's that this battle between uh, good and evil, this battle between uh, the devil and those uh, who trust God, and it's going to be a battle uh, between the devil and her offspring, a reference to Jesus. He shall bruise your head. He conquered him on the, on the cross. You shall bruise his heel. He wounded him on the cross. It's all about the babe in a manger. And then Genesis 3.21, the origin of clothing. God gave garments of skins and clothed them, but it's the first blood sacrifices, uh, 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 really a setup of the sacrificial system. And uh, it's pointing to the one who would be the ultimate sacrifice, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so... At the Creation Museum, when you see that first blood sacrifice, uh, you realize there we have uh, the first blood sacrifice as a covering for their sin. It was a picture of what was to come in Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away our sin. And, and uh, an animal's blood can't take away our sin. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. The life of the flesh is in the blood. Because death is a penalty for sin, Therefore, there has to be the giving of life to pay the penalty for sin, but we're not connected to the animals. We're made in the image of God, and so the blood of bulls and goats can't take away our sin. A man brought sin and death into the world. A man would have to pay the penalty for sin, but it has to be a perfect man. It can't be a sinner, so God steps into history in the person of his son to be the perfect man. Wow, isn't that phenomenal what God did? 
uh, for us and offers a free gift of salvation. He conquered uh, death, raised from the dead. And for those who believe in millions of years, and this is what really hit me back then, in the fossil record, you have lots of examples of animals eating each other bones in their stomachs, but the Bible says originally Adam and Eve and the animals were vegetarian. We as humans weren't told to eat meat until after the flood, just as it gave you the plants. Now God changed our diet after the flood. Now you can eat everything. And if you believe in millions of years, there's lots of documented examples of diseases in the bones in the fossil record, cancer, tumors, arthritis, abscesses. How could all that exist before man when after God made man, he said everything was very good? These two things can't be true at the same time, which means all those fossils couldn't have been laid down over millions of years. How do you understand fossils? You have to start with Genesis 1 to 11. If there was a global flood, you'd expect to find billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. And so um, it really hit me back then, the fossils are the graveyard of the flood, not the graveyard of millions of years. And later on, I was able to understand some of the dating methods. In fact, in 1974, I was also able to obtain a copy of the Genesis flood book. And that's very interesting. Um, so in, uh, I went to the only Christian bookstore I knew of in, in the city of Brisbane because a person at church had said, you know, there's a book in America about the flood. You might want to try to find it. And I went in there and I asked the guy behind the counter, do you have a book from America on the flood? And he said, yes, I do. And he went back and he found it and he brought it to me and it was the Genesis flood. And I bought that. And then that had some of the answers in regard to dating methods and so on to help us understand that. What was interesting, Many, many years later, I was visiting Australia, and there's this elderly lady at the park we were visiting, and she recognized me. And she came up to me, and she was with her daughter, and uh, she, she was uh, probably in her 90s at the time. Um, she's with the Lord now. But she said, oh, you know, tell me about the ministry you're in. And I, I, I mentioned something about the Genesis flood book, and, and because she told me her husband and her ran that uh, that. Uh, bookstore, the Christian bookstore. And she said, oh, tell me about that. And I said, because I bought the Genesis flood from there. And she said, do you know, she said, my husband had this special burden. She said, he couldn't explain it. He would say to me, I meant to have this book in the bookstore. And he made sure he had a copy of that book in the bookstore. It was the only copy they had. And uh, that, so you, you never know what God is doing behind the scenes, uh, orchestrating things for us. Well, in 1975, I moved to a town called Dolby, three hours west of the city of Brisbane, and I became a teacher there, and one of my first classes, well, actually was the first class, the kids said, so we heard you're a Christian, you're going to be running the Christian group in the school, how can you be a Christian when we know the Bible's not true? I said, how do you know the Bible's not true? They said, because, because of what's in our textbooks on evolution. And guess what one of the first questions one of the students asked? Well, he said, no, I couldn't have got all the animals on the ark. And uh, that's when I asked him, how many animals did he need to get on the ark? And he said he didn't know. And I said, what size was the ark? And he said he didn't know. And I realized that student had a problem because an unknown number of animals couldn't fit in an unknown size ark, so therefore it couldn't be true. And I had to point out a little bit of some logic here uh, in regard to that. But you know, when I heard that, I had that Nehemiah anger and I thought, well, why isn't someone doing something about this? And I, I would make sure I taught them the truth. I've heard Years, years later, I heard some students who told me they became Christians because of that impact um, in their classes there. And then I, I would take them to museums, and they're always from an atheist, evolutionist perspective. And the Lord gave me, the only, uh, the only way I told it is, it's like Jeremiah, who had in his heart a burning fire shut up in his bones. Uh, it's almost God gave me this burden, we've got to do something about this. Um, and I started to think about why can't we have a creation museum? So that goes back to the 70s, my teaching days. Um, what, why can't Christians have something, uh, you know, a facility that tells people the truth? Why can't we do that? Why isn't somebody doing this? You know, that Nehemiah anger. I also uh, obtained a copy of the Genesis record, which is a commentary on Genesis by Dr. Henry Morris. Uh, in 1976, we had our first child. Um, and then... Uh, at the end of that year, I was transferred to Brisbane, and this is the house we uh, moved into. And in the front room of this house, uh, this little girl here was born, and I delivered her. My wife says she delivered her. Uh, so, 
That wasn't by choice, by the way. The ambulance didn't arrive in time. My wife had this, we found out, uh, it was called precipitous labor or whatever it is. I mean, our son Jeremy took 11 minutes. Uh, Renee was like 35 to 40 minutes. And I remember she, she yelled at me and I was looking for the ambulance to come in and here's a, here's a baby, what do I do with that? I had no idea, I was a school teacher, a young school teacher. I, I wasn't a doctor. I just remember watching the movies where they hung them up by the legs and whacked them on the bottom. So I tried that and she cried and I thought, well, that worked. So anyway. <laughs> Do you know that that, uh, that girl there founded our Christian Academy and uh, she worked as my executive secretary for a number of years. She became a nurse actually, worked for five years as a nurse. Um, and uh, that's the house that she was born in. And then we had um, a, a daughter, Danielle. She was about 35 minutes. And then under this tree, our son Jeremy was born on the way to hospital. So <laughs> we call this tree Jeremy's tree and we always like to visit Jeremy's tree. Uh, when we go back to Australia. Uh, many of you might know that um, my wife and I, uh, she played piano and I played piano, and so we actually put together a, a music group, and um, my wife is one of the ones who was singing in that as well, and um, a couple of my sisters too, and some friends, and one of her sisters, and we actually would go around churches singing. We, we had quite an itinerary, and uh, I even made up some of the songs for them. Uh, so. Uh, that's what we were like when we moved to Brisbane. I'm still cute. Um, and in those days, I was teaching using uh, an overhead projector. Uh, younger generation, you don't even know what that is, but uh, it would be right here beside me and I'd put film on that and would show up on the screen and, and so on. Uh, in 1977, I and a school teacher friend St uh, conducted the first ever creation apologetic conference in Australia in 1977, and I actually displayed the first lot of books I ever obtained, and we have those out there at that exhibit. And as I displayed all of those books, we had people come to us and say, how do we get these? And then I thought, they said, we need this information. Well, there's that near my anger again. And so I talked to my wife, and we started a bookstore in our home in 1977, and it started in the front room of the house, right here. My, this was just a little patio, and my brother-in-law filled in that patio. This is really where the ministry started, in that patio, right there. And then in uh, 1978, a scientist from America came over, and we were able, that's a whole other story, to be able to get books from master books in, in America, uh, to be able to sell uh, there, and then the ministry started to, to grow. I put a room on the back of the house, look at that. Then we moved into this place, and then we obtained this truck, that was a miracle of the Lord, that provision too, uh, to travel all around Australia. I traveled all over Australia in that truck um, and had some interesting stories about, you know, the warehouse that we were in one day. It was sort of down a slope and with that back, high back on it, I come tearing out of there one day and didn't know the door was halfway down like it sort of is there and ripped the whole thing out. But Oh, and some interesting times. Then, then we were able to get this particular vehicle to drive around in and pull this trailer and travel all over Australia, uh, uh, preaching, teaching. And uh, then in 1979, I left school teaching and went full time into the ministry. That was a, a big step. My wife and I were, were talking about, should I go full time, should I not? And we were on a trip and she read Gen Matthew 6 to me. If, therefore, I tell you, don't be anxious about what... You, uh, your life, what you eat or drink, or about your body, or so on. Uh, look at the birds of the air, are you not of more value than those? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his life? Look at the lilies, etc., etc. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? And so we wrote to a number of our friends and said, if I go full time, would you support us? And they said, yes, we had no guarantees. And so I left school teaching, went full time. Um, people gave us clothes for the kids. There was a, a family that had a fruit and vegetable shop. They would give us a box of fruit and vegetables every week without fail for a, a long time. And uh, that's how the ministry started. And, you know, slowly build up and people would send us money as they were able to. Um, that's how we dressed back then. Shorts and long socks. Look at that. that, that that's how you dress up to preach in church. Um, in 1980, uh, this man here who uh, came on board to, to help us uh, with the ministry and one of our board members, he and I stood on a property and prayed for a creation museum in Australia. That was in 1980. 
And the Lord answered that prayer in America in Kentucky in 2007. <laughs> so God's ways are not always our ways. And then in 1980 to 1986, I visited America. I was asked to come over by Master Books to do tours, to speak, and, and to promote their apologetics materials. And uh, that was our, our family uh, back then. Uh, in 1986, uh, Films for Christ, it was a ministry back then, asked me to do the relevance message in a church called Grace Community Church in Temp Tempe, uh, Arizona. And they filmed me. Are you from Arizona? <laughs> And they filmed me, uh, they were going to do a documentary, but then they made it into a movie of me preaching the message called The Genesis Solution. And so it was a 16 millimeter movie. See, some of you young people never seen one of these, right? <laughs> but, and this was shown in church after church across America and other parts of the world. And it really, really impacted a, a lot of people. And uh, we actually put uh, really state-of-the-art animation at the beginning. This was really unheard of back then to do this on a 16 millimeter movie. Uh, but I want you to watch this animation back then. Now this little bit here I want you to watch, because um, this is leading up to me speaking, but this little bit here in a way is very prophetic, but this is what I was teaching back then and see if you can see if this has happened. And so then after that, I um, then preached this message, um, which is really the main message of this whole ministry that we have today. And uh, you know, when you look at that, what I was saying back then, even in the 70s, if we don't take a stand on God's word, then once you abandon God's word, anything goes. And you're going to see all these things infiltrate the culture and the church. And it's what we've seen today. And so I was asked then to come over and work with the Institute for Creation Research with Henry Morris, Dwayne Gish, and I did that. Uh, for seven years. I was asked to come over and help them here. In 1986, I wrote my first book and it was published in 1987, and that's the updated version of today. M Master Books published it, and it's called The Lie. It is the classic, it's, well, I call it classic Ken Ham. It's, it's the message of the ministry, and it's still the message of the ministry. Um, so there was a photo of us when we moved to the States in 1987. We had four kids. 
Now, and then we had uh, a, a daughter in California, so we have a California girl, who's single, by the way, um, if you're interested. <laughs> See a lot of young people in here. So um, that's, that's our family today, and we now even have one great-grandchild as well as 18 grandchildren. So there we are. Uh, during that time, too, I went to England a number of times and saw all these kids going into the Natural History Museum and I saw a father with a young boy at the Natural History Museum in London looking at this exhibit, and he was about nine or 10 years old, and uh, his father was saying, this is your ancestor, pointing to Lucy there. Um, I mean, it, it, was, it was just so sad. And then reading the signs. Some of us think that we are, humans have a special place in the animal kingdom. However, the human genome is similar to a chimp and has a lot in common with a fruit fly. You're no more valuable than a fruit fly. And then signs like this, the myth of a global flood. And I thought, wow, that poor kid. And I, and I got angry. Why can't we do something about that? And God gave me that fire in my bones. And there's a DVD I have. It's an hour and a half DVD, actually, which has more information in regard to my testimony um, that, uh, that we have. Uh, so I worked in ICL for seven years. Instead of returning to Australia, there were three of us that agreed. And I, I had this burden that I shared about a creation museum. And so myself, Mark Loy, and Mike Zovath, uh, we moved to Kentucky. And uh, we actually uh, formed this ministry in 1983, 1993, I should say, December 1993. And then in November, December 1994, we had our first major board meeting, and we invited some people to be on the board in Jackson, Wyoming, and that's where we decided the name would be Answers in Genesis. So that was in 1994, because we wanted to be about the authority of Scripture. And that is the three of us uh, right before the opening of the Creation Museum. We moved to Kentucky. Where we actually started renting a little place in this strip mall here. Uh, in 1994, we had our first major creation conference in Ohio, in Mount Vernon, Ohio. I met Buddy Davis. And Buddy lived in this log cabin, went back to his log cabin, and we saw he had sculpted dinosaurs. And that really was a turning point for us too, wow, and he wanted to see his dinosaurs used in a museum to tell people the truth. And so we said, hey, this, this could really help us start the Creation Museum. And uh, we eventually moved to this facility, rented office facility, and then in 1998, we put this sign up on this property. We tried to get another property and we had all sorts of fights and atheists opposed us. That's a whole other story. Uh, but uh, we had this prayer meeting on November 21, 1998, for the Creation Museum. One of the neighbours called the police on us because we had an, an unlawful gathering. Uh, so that neighbour today uh, <laughs> likes to do everything he can to oppose us, by the way. You need to pray for him. Uh, so uh, then we closed on the land May 5th, 2000. We asked the owner. We said, we got no money. Can we pay it off at 100000 a year with no interest? And he agreed. Now, I don't know why he agreed, except God let him do that. And these are some of the early artists impressions, you know, um, renditions of what it would be like. March 17th, 2001, we're breaking ground, and uh, here we are as where they're building the Creation Museum. Uh, it's changed a lot, hasn't it? And uh, then in 2001, summer of 2001, God brought Patrick Marsh along. At that stage, we still had no idea how we are going to do the exhibits. We didn't tell people donating to us that, but... Uh, we, we didn't know. We knew God had called us to do this. And I gave Patrick the script for the Seven Seas, and he said, I can make this as good or better than Disney and Universal Studios. And people came to be with him as well, big step of faith, and people supported us by donations and so on. And that was the first part of the Creation Museum. It was the script of the Seven Seas. And you go through the Seven Seas, that is the message from Genesis to Revelation. And the first four seas, uh, that's Genesis 1 to 11. It's the foundation for everything. And then while we're building the ark in 2004, we had a strategic planning session and noticed that we had as number seven here, we should think about building the ark. And what was interesting in 2005, uh, we had another strategic planning session. We said, let's make it number one to build the ark. While we still were building the Creation Museum and didn't even have the money to finish that. Uh, it's what you call stepping out in faith. And then what happened? Well, the opening of the Creation Museum. May. 26th, 2007, the Creation Museum is officially open on account of three, two, two one. one. 
So we had a few thousand people there for that. The atheists camped outside the gates and uh, put, put this message there on the side of their portable toilet, probably the best place for it, actually. <laughs> and you know what they did? They hired a plane to buzz across the opening ceremony to annoy us, saying, thou shalt not lie. And uh, there was a the name of their, their, their group, DEFCON, says, thou shalt not lie. The interesting thing, was, and we had somebody eventually called the airport and got, got them t taken out, but um, it was interesting that they, they were there buzzing us saying, you people are lying. Years later, I found out most people who saw that said, oh, we thought you put that up there for the atheists. Uh, <laughs> so anyway. This is the sign they had right when you're leading up to the entrance to the museum that creationism is one of the vilest forms of child abuse. So that's what they were like. We had also, we've had lawsuits, we've had all sorts of opposition. You know, it reminds me of Nehemiah building the wall. Uh, but you know what? We persevered and look what God's done. And that was our parking lot when it was filled. And then we had to build the, the second parking lot. And of course, the, the museum has grown, as you can see today, uh, to what it is. And then uh, we started building the, the ark. Uh, on November 12, 2015, uh, we actually had a press conference to announce the ark would be open July 7, 2017. How we would know that, I don't know, but we did. Uh, because there was a verse of scripture that, you know, on the same day Noah entered the ark. And we thought, that's a good day to pick, let's do that. Uh, and then. I remember years ago, there was a man called Joshua. He led the people of Israel across the Jordan River and God told them to take 12 stones and to build a memorial as a reminder so that the coming generations would not forget who God is and to also be a reminder to the world. The ark is to be a reminder. We build it as a reminder. It's our 12 stones to remind the coming generations of the truth of God's Word. It's our way of presenting the truth of God's Word and the Gospel to the world. So that was actually uh, uh, July 5, because we had our supporters come in and we opened to the public July 7, 2016. And guess who was outside? The atheists camping outside. And they had all sorts of signs again. They just can't stand Christians having the freedom to get their message out. I mean, we have all the atheist museums all across the world and they're worried about the Ark and the Creation Museum. And, and of course, they're talking about, you know, it's a fable. Well, I agree, that's a fable. Uh, that's why we have an exhibit on that on the second deck, because <laughs> the because the animals won't fit in that. And of course now, when when you look at that, it's absolutely uh, incredible uh, what God has done. And hopefully you're all getting to the ark or been there and uh, see what God has done. And then our new ministry headquarters. That's a whole other story of miracles how that came about. But it was Toyota's headquarters in America. It has a, a basement uh, infrastructure for a massive data center there. And we're looking for a place for our Answers Academy school. And anyway, uh, then we realized this could be headquarters and school. Uh, we have renovated the school side. They're moving in in just six weeks, actually. And it's going to be a beautiful school, uh, as you can see. And we've had people donate all sorts of things. And it's just wonderful. Um, and then, you know, I thought, well, here we are in Australia. This is where the ministry started, right here. And uh, then there's the Creation Museum, and then the Ark, and now our new headquarters. And you look at that and you say, wow, look what God has done. And it goes back to parents who taught us to stand on God's word. It goes back to the commitment my wife and I made to do whatever God wanted us to do and go wherever he wanted us to go. And our commitment to never compromise God's word, stand on his word. This ministry will never compromise God's word. And so... Um, a good man leaves an inheritance or a legacy to his children's children. And so I encourage you to have a look at that exhibit out there. And uh, I'll be out there here. There's Marilyn and I standing in, in front of the ark. And Martin Isles, who will be speaking tomorrow at the ark, uh, he has just been, as I mentioned to you, the board approved my succession plan for him to be appointed as the executive CEO under me as, as the founder CEO uh, to be leading this ministry for the future and you know to be there uh, so that um, 
this ministry will never waver. It'll keep going regardless. I mean, the Lord could come back tomorrow, but he might not for another 100 years. We don't know. But we need to make sure that we're responsible. And so I want to have this set up while we're still here and able to do so. So we have incredible young, younger leadership. We have some wonderful younger leaders here. And uh, Martin is one of those youngest leaders. He actually led a movement in Australia, a Christian movement, that uh, my friends in Australia, family, and Christian pastors that, that love our ministry have said it was the biggest Christian movement since the days of Billy Graham in the 50s and 60s. And so God has prepared him. And he saw my videos as a young man. His parents bought them for him as a young man, probably uh, in middle school equivalent. And he said he binge watched them. And it was a set that I did, recorded in, in just outside of Sydney in the Blue Mountains. Uh, it was a set of 10 videos, and he watched them all, and he said that has impacted him to this day. And uh, he said he realized the answers were in Genesis. And, and then he, he, he said just recently, actually the answers are still in Genesis and always will be. Do you realize answers in Genesis is a wonderful name because the answers will always be in Genesis because that's the foundation for everything. Isn't that incredible how, how the Lord led us to do that? And you know, my favorite exhibit at the Ark is actually this one. It's the door and has a lit cross on it. And I love to see people taking their picture with their family. It is the most photographed part inside the Ark. As a reminder, as Noah and his family went through a door to be saved, we need to go through a door. And that door is the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the legacy we want to leave. And that's why I ask you and challenge you, what legacy are you leaving? You know, I very rarely give this testimony. This just happened to be one of those times when I was asked to do this. So I did. Normally I give all sorts of... But I made sure I did teaching through that anyway because I, I can't talk unless I've got to give some teaching and, and that sort of thing. But uh, it's also in itself teaching. I mean, when you look at how God orchestrated all these things. Now, there is so much more to it. I could spend the rest of the afternoon talking about all sorts of other people. It's like a spider web, that, uh, that there's this complex web, and God brought these people, this person here, and this person, and this person, and this, and this, and this situation, and that, and, and we have all this opposition. You're always going to have opposition. Well, you young people, if you step out in faith to do things, just remember, it's not easy. You're going to have opposition. That's the way it's going to be. Read the scripture. It tells you that. You know, Even when God gave them the promised land, they had to go and fight Jericho and had to fight Ai and they had to fight the giants. And we have had all sorts of struggles and battles with, with people in the church, people outside the church and lawsuits. And, but look what God has done. Uh, I just stand back and say, wow. And you've got to persevere. You've got to be bold. And you've got to have a thick skin too. Um, you've got to be prepared to take all sorts of uh, barbs from people. Uh, and it is not easy. 